All right, we are at high noon and um, I'm Jane Ferreira. I'm the executive director of Humana and uh, wanted to welcome you to our March Lunch and Learn program. Um, we're very excited to have uh, so many people back and we're really excited to have Josh Haas back. Um, Josh, as many of you uh, know by now, if you've been attending our, our programming, um, is a Hamana board member. In fact, he's our, our vice chair um, and he leads our marketing uh, committee. He is a longtime Hawk Watcher. He got his start at the Detroit River Hawk Watch and um, has since gone on to um, create a company called hawksonthewing.com. If you haven't been there, you must go. Um, he is an ex excellent photographer and videographer and his Hawk ID is next to none. So um, we're getting a treat today to see uh, part two, you didn't have to be part of part one, but this is Raptor ID two, um, and he's getting into a little, you know, some less common species um, for ID. So um, Josh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Welcome Great. back. Great, thank you, Jane. Just a mic check, can you hear me okay? Indeed we can. All right, thank you so much. And really thank you everybody for uh, continued support of this program that uh, Jane, Julie and I and, and the Hamana board are very excited about. Uh, I'm also very excited to be with you again. I have to start out with an apology, though, because a lot of the ways that we marketed this particular session was more about late and early season uh, species. So in terms of spring, it'd be early arrivals and fall, it'd be late, uh, late, uh, late migrants. So um, I apologize because it's really not how we've uh, put this program together. I was reminded when I reviewed some of what we did before in part one that it was really split out into common versus less common species. So today we're going to focus on those less common species, but we're also going to start the program with a little bit of, re of review in terms of overall identification techniques for raptors in flight. And I think it'll be a really good uh, refresher for some of those folks that uh, might be, uh, might consider themselves a little bit more advanced. And then it'll also be a really good introduction before we really dive into each of the species today. So um, I always like to start these, these Raptor ID talks though with some, some more exciting video clips. Um, for you folks that were part of part one, you will see, we'll have seen a couple of these, um, but I do have a new one that I'm excited to share uh, that maybe some of you haven't seen before. So we're gonna go ahead and kick that off. Uh, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, hopefully you guys know who this bird is. Uh, if not, it is a female American kestrel displaying their ability to hover hunt. Look at that head just completely locked in, looking for prey while the rest of her body's flailing all about. It's just a wonderful display of how they've adapted to hunt so successfully. So really, really, really awesome. I hope these videos really just kind of wet your palate and, and get you excited for today. Uh, this is vi video footage that came from, uh, as you can see in the background there with the Mackinac Bridge, uh, the Mackinac Straits area. Uh, and these are two bald eagles going at it. Much of you may, may know that bald eagles like to fight over fish. And now the juvenile bird is coming after the adult uh, who has, has successfully uh, grabbed a fish. And what we're about to see is pretty outstanding as the bird flips inverted, grabs the fish, and now the two birds start to tumble in the sky. Uh, really shows just how uh, vital hunting and, and these uh, fish are to these birds um, and just the, the lengths that they go to. Now, this is a merlin, and it just caught a songbird in flight. So I'm expecting a lot of you uh, probably missed that. So we're going to go back and we're going to play that again. Um, but this time I'm going to do it in more of a stop action kind of way and I'll point out where the songbird comes in. So if you look here at the upper part of your screen, upper left coming down, here's the songbird, one frame at a time. The merlin inverts. Look at the bent leg as it catches the songbird. It successfully grabbed it and now from Cape May, if you've ever been there, that bird's on its way to Delaware. So uh, just a, an outstanding uh, display of how they hunt on the wing. And you know what's really cool about that? Not only is it enjoyable to experience something like that, but it also tells us a little something behaviorally uh, in terms of identification. So you're going to hear me a few times today talk about putting the pieces of a puzzle together uh, to really uh, start to reveal a picture and tell us how to properly identify these, these raptors. And one of those puzzles it's not just field marks. It's not just the cadence of flight and, and the shape of the bird and things like that. 
um, but it's how the bird is behaving as well. That can really be a great piece of the puzzle or a clue. So keep that in mind when we get to um, our Merlin later later today. So in terms of a refresher, you know, I always like to share uh, some resources that really help in terms of planning your trip uh, to a local hawk watch. Uh, whether you're going to, you know, you're, if you find yourself like me in Michigan and you're excited to go to either Whitefish Point or Mackinac or Detroit, you know, you might consider those your local stop. If you're traveling, hawkcount.org uh, at the same time can be a wonderful resource uh, for figuring out when you want to plan your trip. And if you don't have the luxury of, of changing times or dates and that sort of thing, you can at least get an idea of what to expect. Uh, these birds tend to come at specific times or, or ranges of dates. And uh, with, with good luck uh, in terms of the weather and a little bit of planning on your part using tools like Hawk Count, um, you can actually have pretty good success uh, knowing uh, what to expect and what birds you're going to see that day. And so uh, if you're not familiar with Hawk Count, uh, head over to hawkcount.org. It's, it's really what we at Humana like to consider our flagship resource. Um, and it's really a resource that makes all of our North American migration site data for raptor migration available to you, our constituents and the public for free. So uh, it's a great resource. Check it out. Uh, it can really aid with, with planning your trips. Now, in terms of, of bird identification and more specifically raptor identification in flight, I always like to say it's kind of where science and art collide. Uh, if you're a fan of, you know, Jerry's work um, or some of these, uh, you know, banders, uh, if you've ever worked with, with a bander to really experience all the science that goes into identifying these birds and taking down the specific data about the birds that they capture, that's very scientific. Um, but in terms of Viewing these specks in the sky at, at a far distance, um, it's to me, it's kind of less of a science and, and it becomes more of an art form. Um, it's kind of like music. If you've ever found yourself um, struggling to identify birds in song, um, you know, those that have a musical background tend to be able to pick up on it a little quicker than those that don't. And so it is, in a sense, where uh, some art comes in and, and where this collision of science and art can happen. Um, as I said before, you know, you're going to hear me refer to the pieces of the puzzle quite often today. And it's important to realize probably the most important thing is to never fixate on one trait. Um, oftentimes, just one trait is never diagnostic or enough to truly identify these birds. Um, as many of you have probably experienced, they can be incredibly difficult, especially if you're facing south into the sun uh, in a spring watch and they're heading north at you. Oftentimes, you have no chance at getting any kind of field marks. So you really have to change your behavior and, and kind of flip a switch in your mind uh, in terms of how you identify these birds. It's not looking for that blue and orange brilliant coloration on that male kestrel that we see on the left. It's more looking at the shape of the wings. Uh, and then in flight, live, looking at how it's flying in terms of its wing cadence, its shape, um, its behavior in flight and things like that. So um, one of the biggest things, you know, that, that myself as well as any experienced hawk watcher will always tell you is there's nothing better than getting in the field and being in the field with someone who knows more than you. It's, it's how all of us, myself included, learned. I, I have countless examples where I've learned tips and tricks and ways to identify from my mentors in the field. And I continue to have mentors in the field. I always have this continuing learning, uh, continual learning mindset where I, I feel like, you know what, there's going to be something new to learn today. And so when you look at these birds, look at them with intentions to continually learn and look for little variances in how each individual is flying. Um, and pretty soon after you see enough of them, you can start to develop your own ways of identifying them. And that is really when light bulbs will start to go off in your mind. Um, I can tell you all day long, or Frank Nicoletti, or you know Jerry Lagori, any any anyone who is an experienced hawk watcher can tell you how they identify these birds over and over. But it's not until something really clicks in terms of an experience with with yourself that it really starts to stick in your mind. So really have that continual learning mindset, and and be okay knowing that not every bird is going to be identified. Even the experts have to hit unidentified raptor at at some time. 
Um, and that's totally okay. Be okay with that and be willing to fail because those failures really just uh, materialize as opportunities in front of you. So as I mentioned very briefly, it is more or less a, a different form of identification. If we find ourselves at Cape May in spring or say Issa Toledo um, at McGee Marsh for warblers, really our mindset is focused on um, field mark birding. So we're looking for the colors and specific color field marks on these birds to tell us that it's a um, blue, black-throated blue warbler or a black-throated green warbler or whatever it may be. Again, when we're especially at a spring watch and we're looking into the sun at the south, most of the time we're going to be seeing what we see on the right here, a peregrine in full shadow. Uh, and because of that, that mindset change is really necessary. And we have to throw that classic field mark birding out the window and train our brains to look at the, the shape of the bird, how it's flying and behaving in the sky, the, the type of wing beat, whether it's stiff, floppy or soft, uh, deep or shallow. Um, the, the speed and cadence of that, uh, that wing beat. Those are all types of things that we're going to look for in these raptors because oftentimes they're either at a distance or they're so silhouetted that field marks really fall short. So uh, when we think about this puzzle, think about doing a puzzle with your kids or your grandkids. Oftentimes you don't need to put together the entire puzzle for the image of whatever you're putting together to really appear. And as we see here on screen, we're seeing this red tail appear. And those with some experience probably could tell it was a red tail before uh, the latter half of the puzzle pieces really started to come in. And that the point here is you don't have to have every single um, piece of the puzzle to identify this as a red tail. You might only need the tail or you might only need um, one of those pieces covering the wing to see just how muscular and bulging those primary feathers are uh, to know that, hey, this is a big meaty bird. This is likely a bootio and, and likely a red tailed hawk. And as more of those pieces come in, you'll start to see enough to then diagnostically identify the bird as such. So in terms of the general migrating families, and I do want to, you know, at least set this expectation that this program is really more suited towards the East Coast, um, anything east of the Mississippi. But uh, that's not to say that these birds aren't going to be seen west of the Mississippi and down through um, South and cent or Central, uh, Central and South America. So keep this in mind. Yes, you're, you're, you're going to have some species if you're in the, you know, Rockies that, that are missing today. Um, but much of what we're going to discuss, you'll also see west of the Mississippi as well. So in terms of those general families, we have our um, occipiters, our sharp shin hawk, as you can see here. We have falcons, uh, as we can see those uh, slender wings, and, and they're all about speed when we talk about falcons. Um, we see a peregrine on the screen right now. We also have the bootios. These are those classic soaring birds that we love so much. Um, we see a red-tailed a uh, nice borealis, eastern borealis bird right here on the screen. Um, but oftentimes in terms of bootios, hawk watchers are excited to see our, our massive numbers of broad wings come through. That's a great example of a bootio. Uh, then we have our eagles and vultures. So uh, obviously many of us, especially in adult form, we're very familiar with our bald eagle. And we're probably very familiar with turkey vultures. But things, uh, you know, if you find yourself more on the east coast or more to the south, you might have black vultures that come into play that could cause some confusion. So these are all things that we need to watch out for. And lastly, we have our osprey and harriers. Um, we see a northern harrier on the screen today, which we are going to feature both of those birds. And I have realized that my computer is not plugged in, so bear with me just one second. I'm going to plug this in. Okay, so now we're going to dive in. And the first thing I want to point out is the way that these slides are set up uh, is very consistent throughout the rest of this program. So you're going to see on the left-hand side a range map. So you get a, a, a good sense of where to find these birds, um, whether it's during breeding season or migration uh, or during the winter. You're going to see uh, a quick picture of the bird. This is really important. You're going to see soaring and gliding profiles for each of these species. And that's really important because whether they're soaring or gliding, uh, they hold their wings differently. I will talk about the differences there because that's often a question that does come up. Um, and then lastly, some quick flight tips. Now, this by all means is not the end all be all. There are 
pages and pages and pages of tips and tricks and ID techniques that you can read about how to identify each of these species. Um, however, I've kind of boiled it down to three or four of what I feel are the most important uh, and thrown those here on our slide. Now back to the soaring and gliding. So oftentimes people kind of confuse themselves with what the difference is between soaring and gliding. So think of soaring, um, picture that beautiful majestic red-tailed hawk out on, on a farm field, majestically circling and maybe rising in altitude. Or maybe your broad wings that are coming through in big groups and you see them circling in the tornado that we call kettles, those big groups of birds that are circling and what we call soaring, rising in altitude and going up and up and up. That's soaring. Now gliding is going from point A to point B with a very specific intent. So they're not wavering, they're not circling, they're basically just gliding without flapping all the way from point A to point B. Now you might have then active flight where uh, a Cooper's hawk might be flapping and gliding, flapping and gliding. Now that's considered active flight, but as part of that active flight, they are going to glide and they're going to show their gliding profile when they're doing so. So I just wanted to stop there and make sure that everybody knew the difference between soaring and gliding. Now you may also be wondering, hey, Josh said at the beginning, we're gonna talk about less common species. Why the heck are we looking at sharp shinned hawk? Well, I want to do a refresh on sharp shinned and Cooper's hawk. They are not uh, uncommon at most, of our sites, uh, to say the least. In fact, one of the tips that I got from one of my mentors, uh, Kelvin Brennan, uh, years and years ago when I was starting was, you know, you could kind of judge your day of migration by the, uh, the sharpshin numbers from the start of the season all the way to the end. And what he meant by that was when you're at a hawk migration site, once the Sharpies really start to, to take off and, and you start to see um, some numbers of Sharpies coming through, that's usually an indication that the rest of the birds are going to start migrating as well. And then on the back side of that, when you start to see your, your numbers of sharp shins start to tail off at the end of the day, that can be another indicator that maybe migration is getting ready to shut down for the day. So just kind of a cool tip that I always uh, thought was pretty neat from Calvin. So anyway, um, I do want to revisit sharp shin and Cooper's hawk. Um, and as Jane mentioned, you know, hawks on the wing, the, the, the beauty of my movie is that um, I share side-by-side -side video clips while I identify these birds side-by-side -side on the screen. We're going to visit a few of those today and give you an opportunity at the end to choose your own side-by-sides and, and we'll play them for you. Um, but I do want to focus on Sharpies and Coops because even though they're not that common or uncommon rather, um, they cause us all the most grief. And so I thought it'd be great to revisit. So when we look at Sharpies, or sharp shinned hawks, they're very quick and snappy wing beat flyers. And it's more from the wrist, almost fluttery, um, not unlike a Cooper's hawk that's more using the entire wing, not just from the wrist outward. Now, oftentimes our first trick to look for in sharpies is does the bird have a square tail? Uh, the, you need to be really careful with this. Uh, a lot can be happening during migration with the tail. Uh, there could be missing tail feathers that give a Sharpie's tail a rounded appearance. And if you only look at that tail and you see it's rounded, if you're only using that one trait, like I said earlier, not to do, you could call out a Cooper's hawk when in reality, when you look at the rest of the pieces of the puzzle, you indeed actually have a sharp shin hawk. So just be real careful with that. Cooper's hawks can come through with very square looking tails and Sharpies can come through with very round looking tails. Uh, it's just something to be very aware of. Uh, another really important fact about the Sharpies in flight is their head uh, is often tucked way back in. Their, their shoulders or their wings are kind of thrust forward, especially in a glide. Um, and it makes, makes this little pocket for their head to sit nicely within. And it really, in, in all facets of flight, their heads just look really small. There's no head projection where their head is not projected forward in front of their wings. So let's take a look at what our Sharpie looks like in flight. Here's our soaring bird. Look at, look at where the tail is fanned, but it comes to a very tight, thin pinch point before it meets the body. Okay, this bird's soaring on pretty well flat wings. And notice just how tiny that head is when you look at this bird. It's all tail and all wings. 
the tail's almost not, or excuse me, the head is almost non-existent. Now we get a little closer view of the wing beat. Again, it's more from the wrists outward. Very, very, very quick and very snappy. Okay. In, in contrast, which we'll see in a minute, the Cooper's Hawk is going to be a little bit more full bodied and not nearly as snappy, not nearly as quick. So again, this is a soaring bird that's also actively flapping. Now we're going to see these bent wings. They're kind of drooped down a little bit, and that's the gliding profile. So this bird is an active flight. It's flapping and gliding. But when it's in its glide, you'll notice that the wings are slightly drooped. When they're soaring or gliding rather overhead, to me, they look like little button mushrooms that you'd find in the grocery store. Right there, kind of a, a nice little button mushroom. And right there, you can see that little pocket where the head kind of tucked back nicely within. So in contrast, our Cooper's Hawks, look at the soaring profile. Now, instead of flat wings like our Sharpie, now we have a slight dihedral where those wings are kind of upturned just ever so slightly. They have a very similar gliding profile, maybe not as drooped, um, but that soaring profile is a very good piece of the puzzle. Again, their wing beat is much more full bodied. It's stiffer and it comes from the body outward. And we're going to look for a, a slightly stiffer wing beat right there. We're seeing a nicely rounded tail, but again, I've, I've hit the points here again. Be very careful here. Cooper socks can appear to have squared off tails in some cases, so you have to be really careful. And the reason Cooper socks typically have a rounded tail appearance is they have graduated tail feathers, so that as the tail feathers go out towards the ends, uh, they're shorter, uh, so it gives them that rounded tail appearance. Um, the wings, in, in a lot of cases, uh, they tend to look about the same as the Sharpie, but look close sometimes because they're a bigger bird, um, and oftentimes they don't have their, their, their wings thrust forward. Um, it gives the appearance of a thinner looking wing. And so that matched with this much more projected head where it's a larger looking head that's projected forward in front of the wings. It gives that appearance of a thinner winged bird with a much larger head. So let's see what this guy looks like in flight. Notice that wing, fleet, wing flap right away. It's stiffer. It's, it's using the entire wing. It's not as, as, as um, quick and snappy as the Sharpie. And also notice there's a nice slightly upturned dihedral uh, in a soar. But notice how stable this bird is. It's in control. The tail is just as long, but you don't see that pinch point. There's a little bit more substance to the tail as it meets the body. And look as it's flapping, the body's absolutely in control and, and no problems in the wind. Um, in contrast, the Sharpie's kind of bouncing all over the place. The Cooper's Hawk is in really good control. Again, look at that head. It's projected way far forward. The bird's soaring in nice wide open circles and it's in very good control. Now in active flight, here's another classic occipiter active flight where we're flapping and gliding, you're going to see more gliding in a Cooper's Hawk than flapping, where in a Sharpie, you're going to see more flapping than gliding. So when we compare these two, just a real quick look at that tail. Yes, we're going to see a squared off tail and the Sharpie on the right. Notice the smaller head. Those shoulders or those wrists are thrust forward, so it creates that little pocket for the head to sit nicely within. You'll see on the left on our Cooper's Hawk, there's a lot more head projection. And the, the wings, because they're extended further out, they have this appearance of looking thinner. Not that they're actually thinner, but in, in, uh, in the way we're looking at the bird soaring, especially, they look thinner. So let's see. This is actually a clip right from Hawks on the Wing where we can see these birds side by side as they're going along. The Sharpshin versus Cooper's comparison represents one of the most difficult pairings, but there are clues that help distinguish the two. Notice the Cooper's Hawk on the right has a longer, bulkier tail that also feels more round. Don't forget, however, the round versus square tail doesn't always hold true. Also notice the Sharpie on the left shows a smaller head that is tucked back closer to the body, where the Coop's head projects forward. While soaring, Sharpies will flap more often because they are less stable, where the Coop holds steady. Also look as the Sharpshin Hawk is making tighter circles. The bird is actually starting to get ahead of the coop. Comparing the wing flap is easier when side by side. Notice the Cooper's Hawk has a slightly slower wing beat, but more importantly it's using more of the entire wing, 
whereas the Sharpie is quicker, snappier, and flaps more from the wrist outward. Check out this Sharpie displaying its tendency to flap more often, where the coupe is gliding longer between flaps. Okay, so that was a good example of, of seeing those birds side by side, which is super, super useful. So goshawks, so this is our, really our entry point into the more less common species. And I'm sure many of you dream of seeing that goshawk. I know it's one of my uh, species that I go after when I go to Whitefish Point each, each spring, um, is it's the goshawk. They're just a gorgeous, very, very large occipiter. I mean, just you see them close up and you can't believe how big these birds are. But notice in the picture, the tail, I love, looking at the tail of these birds because it almost, it's so wide, it's so substantial, uh, substantial. It, it's like an extension of the body. It's not the body ending and the tail beginning. It's almost like they're together. Uh, look at the muscular nature, nature of the wings. And what I'm talking about is kind of the, the trailing edge here, at how bulged out uh, the trailing edge of the wings are. Very muscular. The wing beat of this bird's very deep and powerful, and it's at the same time very rhythmic. Notice the head. Now in a soar, goshawks tend to have heads that look really quite small. But as we're seeing in this bird, in active flight or in a glide, they project them way far forward. And, and as we compared Cooper's hawks to projecting forward more than Sharpies, goshawks do it more than Cooper's. So let's see what this guy looks like in flight. Now you'll notice uh, pretty flat winged there, very smooth, very in control. Notice in a soar, that head doesn't look like it's projected very far forward. Much slower, uh, slower, smooth wing beat uh, compared to that Cooper's hawk, especially compared to the sharp chin hawk, and very much in control. Now in active flight, look at the bulging uh, trailing edge of the wings right here, and notice the giant head projected forward, almost looking around uh, like a, a, a snapping turtle with its head out looking around. Look at that wing, wing flap, deep, rhythmic, and quite powerful. The bird uh, has this display of being in full control. Look at how substantial that tail is. It's like the body just keeps going beyond uh, the wings there, when in reality, it's the tail. Very bootio-like, very smooth in flight, and when it's gliding, it does droop its wings as we see here. So the rare occurrence, uh, not something that we're gonna be ex as Lucky to see as often, but certainly one of the more exciting birds when, when we do see them. Now, I mentioned Merlin earlier. Um, I, one of my favorite things that I learned from another one of my mentors early on from Jeff Schultz was that uh, the way to describe a Merlin is a, an American kestrel on steroids. It's like the, the kestrel went to the, uh, to the gym, got some steroids, and really pumped up. Uh, so these birds are very, very powerful. Uh, they're absolutely fearless, uh, very feisty, and, and very territorial. Even in migration, they'll go after anything, whether it's a kestrel or another merlin or e everything as is, is large as a golden eagle. Uh, they, they like their space, and they don't want anyone in it. Uh, their wing beats very, very powerful, incredibly rhythmic and consistent, and they fly from point A to point B incredibly fast. Uh, typically at very low altitudes. They're one of those birds that kind of pops up. And oftentimes it's not, hey, look, there is a Merlin. It's often there was a Merlin. They will surprise you in, in all facets. And oftentimes um, you won't even know that they're there. So they're a tougher one to count uh, and be tallied and even tougher to, uh, to get if you're a newbie. They're quite small and stocky. Um, but the stocky is the key there. So when we're putting the puzzle pieces together and we're trying to figure out if we've got a Merlin or a Kestrel, which is going to be its closest um, nemesis in terms of how you identify, um, these guys look stockier. They, they, they just look bulkier. And especially in the wings here in the secondaries, they tend to be more uh, perpendicular to the body and a lot thicker um, in, in the wing than a, a dainty Kestrel with these really thin, dainty wings. Um, a lot of the books will describe their wing beat as very piston-like um, from a, an internal combustion engine, where a piston is just constantly going up and down smoothly at a consistent speed. That's a Merlin wing beat to a T. So let's see what that looks like. Again, look, I know we haven't seen the Kestrel. Maybe that's a good one to see 
um, at the end in terms of a comparison, but these wings are very much bulky, much bulkier than that of a Kestrel. Um, they're also much smoother in flight. I think their stocky, heavier nature allows them to be. Um, and they tend to, to, to soar uh, and glide really both on flat to slightly drooped wings. Notice how perpendicular that trailing edge of the wing is compared to the body. So not as thin winged and not as dainty and angular as uh, we would see in a Kestrel. Again, very similar uh, glide profile, flat, slightly drooped, very powerful. Again, point A to point B, they stay on point. They don't, uh, they don't waver unless they're going after another bird in their space. And when they set out to fly, unless they're hunting something, uh, they're gone. And so as we saw in that exciting video at the beginning, one of their behavioral traits is to hunt on the wing while they're in migration. They don't stop to eat. They eat right on the wing and uh, they just keep on going. Uh, to round out our falcons now is our beautiful peregrines. So uh, these are the largest of the falcons that we're going to see, especially in the East Coast. Uh, they're very prominent in the sky, much heavier looking than that of a merlin. Although I will say that they can be problematic in terms of identifying a peregrine or a merlin in certain types of flight, especially active flight, not knowing uh, distances, uh, size can, can fail you. Uh, so it, it does uh, tend to be problematic at times. Uh, especially in a soar, their wings are perpendicular and quite straight uh, coming out of the bodies. Uh, their, their wing tips come straight out and they kind of end like arrow points or um, I think uh, in some of the books, they'll, they'll talk about it looking like the flame of a candle. So if you can picture the nice, um, consistent look of a candle where it goes to a point, that's what the wings look like, especially in a soar. Uh, because they're heavier and they're very stable in flight, they do soar in very wide circles. And in a soar, their tail is often fanned out. So that can be a little clue that you can look, like, uh, look for. Uh, in terms of their wing beat, uh, it's very smooth and it's more whip-like. So picture kind of like this whipping, uh, whipping motion uh, that they do. And they do it very quickly uh, and repetitively. So let's take a look at what these guys look like. Okay. Now, this is high winds and this bird is in very good control. Notice as this, in a soar, the tails is pretty wide or fanned. And there's that candle flame looking arrow pointed wing that goes perpendicular out from the body and then to a perfect point on both sides. Um, very symmetrical on both sides of the body. So soars in very wide circles, doesn't take a huge amount of flapping. When we flip over to our active flight, look at that whip-like wing beat. It's just kind of whipping the air as it's going from point A to point B. Much heavier looking, a lot more stable, and, and not nearly as fast as you would see in a Merlin. The Merlin's typically just shooting by like a rocket uh, from point A to point B. These guys tend to um, be a little bit more methodical about it. There's that whip-like wing beat. It's not very deep. It's quite shallow. And that's our peregrine falcon. So we're going to cross the barriers into our bootios. Obviously, in our common species talk several months ago, we would have gone through red tail. Uh, today, we're going to go through the less common stuff, depending on where you are. Certainly, we can have great red-shouldered flights at certain uh, spots. Spring is here. Uh, Braddock Bay is a wonderful place to go for uh, spring flights of red shoulders. So a good little tip there. You can see the numbers uh, and, and when to go by using hawk count. Um, red shoulders have a really peculiar gliding profile in that their wings are very drooped. They're downward drooping. Uh, so that glide profile is really nice. You can see that from a couple miles out. And uh, it's, it's so peculiar, in fact, that even that far out, you can see that you've got a red shoulder. These guys tend to be more occipiter-like. So if at a distance you have what you think might be a, a big occipiter, but as it gets closer, you realize, no, that tail's not quite long enough. The shape of the wings are right more for a bootio. It's almost always going to be a red-shouldered hawk. Uh, none of the other bootios are, are really confused with occipiters like red-shouldered hawks can be. I love when these guys are soaring too because they tend to uh, thrust their wings forward in the shape of a C or like a smiley face if you're looking at it sideways. Um, and then if you're lucky enough, if the sun's just right and hitting the birds just right, you can see these crescents 
on the outer primary feathers. Just be real careful there. Juvenile bunios of other species will show uh, window looking. Um, they're not crescent shaped. They're more um, translucent uh, outer primary feathers that give this appearance of windows. Uh, but they're much larger in the other bootios, where in the red shouldered, whether it's a juvenile or um, an adult bird, you're going to see that very thin crescent shape. So that's something to look for as well. So we'll see our red shouldered in flight. Um, notice that it's not nearly as muscular or bulging in the wings as something like um, a red tailed hawk. And there is that classic thrusted wings forward in the shape of a C. Okay. And when they're in a soar like this, they're flat wings or maybe just slightly upturned, as you can see right there, but not as upturned as much as a red-tailed hawk. Um, and again, look for the wing beat. It's, it's snappy. It's quicker. It's more occipiter-like. So here's a bird in active flight. You can see in the wings that you have a bootio here. Even though the tail is somewhat long, it's not nearly long enough to be something like an occipiter or a harrier. Um, then you look at the wings and you know, hey, I've got a bootio, but it's, it's, it's small, it's snappy. Um, we may have a red shouldered hawk here. And here's that more peculiar down drooping glide. This is a classic shoulder just gliding by the watch. We're going to see another angle where you'll see those down drooping wings even more. And it's that bow shape that we're looking for. And you'll see that in some of the other birds. Red tails will do it as well, but they don't typically uh, droop their wings as deep as a red shoulder as well. And you'll see that uh, infinitely uh, more when they're, when they're gliding right at you. That's the best, the best way to see that. So lastly, with our bootios um, is our rough-legged hawk. And this is another one that I chase at Whitefish Point. Wonderful place to go see rough-leggeds if you've never been. It's a, it's a magical place. Um, rough-leggeds are very, very unique in their wing beat compared to the other bootios. No other bootio, at least on the East Coast, is gonna be as, as deep and uh, powerful and slow uh, in terms of the rough legged. So their soaring profile is a, a pretty deep, it's almost turkey vulture deep uh, when you look at that dihedral. So that, that upturned wing, that V look in, in the soaring profile is very deep. Uh, but much like the red shouldered having a peculiar glide profile, so does the rough legged, but it's different. So we always like to talk about dihedral where it's that V shape in the wing. But when we talk about a, a, a modified dihedral, that's where the wing comes up and then it goes flat from wrist to tip. And that's what we're gonna see in the video uh, very clearly in that glide profile. They're very confident in the air. You know, at Whitefish Point, when they leave the point, they basically have about 17 and a half, 18 miles of water to cross. A lot of these birds will go out, they'll come back, they'll go out, they'll come back. They're nervous for obvious reasons. They don't do well over water. Uh, but rough leggeds, if you've got an adult rough legged, even in subpar winds, uh, these birds go. They don't, they don't even waver. And so they're very at home in the air and, and very confident. And let's see what they look like in flight. So notice that it's a little bit floppier wing beat, but much, much slower. And also look how thin the wings are compared to something like the bulging muscular red-tailed hawk. We see that upturned dihedral, and right now we're going to see the wings are thrust forward just a little bit. But if we were comparing this to a red shoulder, look how much longer the wings are compared to the body. The bodies tend to look really small, like little rocket footballs, if you've ever seen one of those. They're these tiny little balls with a long tail on them. That, to me, is a spitting image of a rough-legged hawk. Uh, notice how confident and comfortable the bird is in the air. And right here, we're going to see this bird turn. Look at that. Nice, smooth, powerful wing beat. Much, much slower than any other bootio on the East Coast. And now we get to start to see this glide profile where it goes up, flattens out, and then goes from wrist to tip much, much more flat. So that's just a classic, classic rough like it. Now, at a distance, that modified dihedral, you can almost have trouble comparing rough leggeds to turkey vultures at a distance because the turkey vultures, when they're streaming, will have that modified look as well. This is one of my favorite birds. It's probably not for many of you, uh, but for us in Michigan, we're not lucky enough to see black vultures all that often. We're lucky to get maybe one a season, if that, um, at least for now, uh, things may be changing there. But uh, at any rate, us in Michigan, anytime we have a black vulture, there's a high level of excitement. 
Um, these guys, you know, they're typically much, much smaller and very stocky looking. Look, notice the feet in relation to the tail. The tail is absolutely short compared to something like a turkey vulture. These guys, the shape of them, especially when you see them in active flight, they look like miniature eagles. Uh, very broad wings. They just, they just have that stocky eagle-like appearance. Their wing beat, especially compared to something like a turkey vulture, is incredibly fast. It's very, very quick. And it feels hurried. One of the things I, I like to always tell people, it looks like they're a younger sibling chasing after their brother, trying to catch up. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to see the field marks, which oftentimes we're not, but if you are, um, you'll notice that just the wing tips have that silvery appearance about them compared to the entire trailing edge of a turkey vulture. And I always like to tell people, it looks like they've just dipped their wings in, in white paint and have taken off. So let's see what this guy looks like. They're going to have a similar uh, deep soaring profile, uh, but then they're more flat winged when it comes to gliding. Notice the feet hanging down. Classic, classic black vulture. Look at the wing. The wing shape just, it almost looks like a golden eagle to me. There's absolutely no tail on this bird. You can physically see the, the feet hanging below and behind the tail. You can even see in bad lighting, the tips of the wings are visibly lighter than the rest of the bird. Similar to turkey vultures, they don't, in a soar, they don't typically see uh, or show their heads very well. So kind of look small headed uh, in a soar. They just flex the shoulders, similar to turkey vultures, but wait till you see this bird flap its wings. It's amazing. That to me, it looks like a giant fruit bat flying through. Nothing like a raptor for a second there. But picture a miniature eagle with short, snappier wing beats coming through the watch, and that's a black vulture. Look at the short, tiny tail, almost no tail, almost looks a little bit like a barred owl flying, if you've ever been lucky enough to see one of those. Very cool bird. In contrast, let's look at the thin-winged northern harrier. So northern harriers are very, very um, unique, I'll say. So they have a very, very deep soaring profile. And again, a similar glide profile that's modified where it comes up and then flattens out. But in the Harrier, it doesn't fully flatten out from wrist to tip. It continues going up, but at a slower incline. Uh, so that's something to look for. But the key with a Harrier, other than their incredibly long, thin tail, are these long plank-like wings. To me, they look like a bird that has a plank of two by four hanging out each side of the body. Very thin, very rectangular. There's not a whole lot of muscular shape to it at all. Very rectangular and very slender. Um, their, their wing beats very slow and steady. Um, and uh, one of the great tips that uh, Eric Brunke from Cape May shared uh, one time I was there was their wing beat looks like they're bouncing basketballs on, on their tips. I just thought that was such a great way to describe it. And uh, hopefully you'll see that when we go into the video here. The first thing to look at is really that long, stru slender structure to the wing. Look how long and rectangular those wings are. It's at home in the air, it's soaring very easily, although it is rocking a little bit, similar to like a turkey vulture. Uh, see how it's rocking back and forth? But there's a nice view where we stop the footage and you can see that long, clank like two by four looking wing. Try to ignore that white rump, though. I know everybody sees a white rump and they assume Northern Harrier on that tail. Um, but especially in heavy winds, Cooper's hawks and some of the other birds, even red tailed, will have their undertail coverts fold up and over, making it appear that they have a, a, a white rump. There's that modified dihedral where it goes up very steeply and then slows down, but continues to incline out from wrist to tip. So similar to our rough legged, uh, so you really have to look close. And, but now when you see him flap, it's again, it's kind of bouncing those basketballs on the tips of its wings and, and very slow but very, very smooth and steady. And there's that white rump we, gotta have to, we do have to be careful of, but it is crazy how far out you can see that white rump on harriers. And if you're lucky enough, you know, these birds are sexually dimorphic. So if you're lucky to see an adult male, what we call the gray ghost, uh, that does, does promote some excitement at any hog watch. Last on our list before we go to some questions and some opportunities to see some side-by-sides, is our osprey. Uh, ospreys are just incredibly magnificent birds. If you've ever seen them hunt, they're just wonderful to watch. 
Um, but outside of hunting, they have a really weird flight pattern. Um, and the best way to describe it is painful. These birds, when they're coming through, whether they're soaring and, uh, and flapping or they're in full active flight, they look like they want nothing to do with flapping their wings. It just looks painful, like they don't want to be doing it. Um, these are the birds that are often confused, especially at a distance, with gulls. So if you first identify, oh, I think I've got a, a gull here, but there's something different about it. Um, even aside from the coloration, there's something different about it. As it gets closer, you see it's a raptor, it's always going to be an osprey. If there's any question about whether it's a raptor or a gull, it's almost always an osprey that turns out to be a raptor. Um, in both soaring and gliding, they're always going to have that kind of M shape, that uh, um, very kind of bold looking uh, profile, both in soaring and gliding. They're very long, gull-like, and again, their wing beat tends to be very painful or stiff looking. Um, some authors will describe it as looking like the bird is arthritic, uh, like it's gotten uh, older at an age where it's just not at home to flapping any longer. So let's see what this bird looks like in flight. So notice uh, bowed wings. It's, it's pretty obvious even, even looking up above. And uh, when the bird, especially when it's soaring, um, but also when it's gliding, there's always this uh, shallow sh M shape, um, M as in mama. So you can kind of see it goes up, down, up, down. And in almost all facets of flight, you're going to see that shallow M shape uh, in an osprey. Look how long winged but still bowed that wing structure is. Very gall-like, very, very gall-like. And at a distance, you know, other than the, the wings being a little bit more plank-like and longer, at a distance, you almost might see some white-tailed kite in this bird. Um, but once it gets closer, you'll notice that the wing structure is totally different. There's that wing beat. It, it's, it's stiff, almost painful looking, like as it's curving around in the wind, it's trying not to flap its wings. Very, very shallow, and it's doing everything it can to glide as much as it, it, as it can, which is odd when you compare it to how they hunt, especially when they're hover hunting. They look like they're so at home above the water. So those are our, what I would consider our, our less common species. I mean, in some sites, you know, things like osprey and merlins, you know, at Cape May, they may not be less common, but um, on the whole, they tend to be a little bit less common. Um, now, I, I think I'm going to have to probably bring up a little bit of a black bar here. My apologies if you're seeing some black bars. Um, we may have some trouble with our chat here, so I just want to make sure we're seeing the chat. Um, okay. Jane or Julie, are you seeing any of the chat? I just shot a note to everybody and said if anybody has a side by side they want to see to let us know in the chat. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and we've gotten a, a couple just kind of making sure that Chad is working. Um, mm -hmm. I think people are just being quiet today. Okay. Okay. Good. So we're in good order then. Um, so this is a great, before we go into maybe questions, maybe this is a good opportunity. Definitely type in your message in the chat if you'd like to see a side by side. I think while we're waiting for some to come in, I'd like to play the Kestrel versus Merlin though, because I made reference to the differences between those birds several times today. So I'm going to start with that one. While these two raptors both have classic falcon wings, there are some key things to look for that will help you better tell them apart. Notice the Merlin on the left has slightly stockier wings. They are especially hefty from the body to the wrists. The Kestrel on the right appears thinner and longer winged. In fact, everything about the Kestrel is thinner all around. Be careful as both birds hold their wings slightly drooped in a soar. Be sure to pay attention to other clues. Notice the kestrel is rising and lowering, both while flapping and gliding. In active flight, the merlin flaps more often and is more active overall. The wing beat of the merlin is fast at a constant even rate. They have a direct line of flight and rocket through it. The kestrel often flaps and glides in an alternating fashion. They're more buoyant and move around a lot in their space. Okay. 
You see folks have asked for goshawk and red shoulder. I'm gonna go there. Northern goshawks and red-shouldered hawks are one of the harder comparisons, but rest assured it can be done. In a soar, check out the red-shouldered hawk on the right and how far in front its wings are pushed forward, a typical soaring position for this bootio. In comparison, the goshawk on the left holds its wings at right angles to its body. Also notice the red-shouldered has a slight upturn or dihedral, where the goshawk is flat-winged in a soar. The goshawk has a smooth, powerful, deep wing beat and the tail is stockier, almost like an extension of the body. Notice the red-shouldered has a snappier, stiff wing beat making the bird appear more occipiter-like. They also tend to be more energetic in flight as they rise, fall, and flap more often. Okay, before we get to the next one, uh, I, I believe someone asked for red-shouldered versus Swainson's. I don't offer Swainson's yet. That's likely going to be a part of the, the next edition when we do more Western species. Um, but in terms of just kind of talking through red-shouldered versus Swainson's, focusing on Swainson's, you know, they tend to be really light and more buoyant in the sky. They're really great, um, just really at home in the sky. Um, but if we talk about, remember that peculiar glide profile of um, the red shouldered, you know, oftentimes um, Swainson's will have more of a heavy dihedral. Um, so that's, that's a big clue that, you know, if you see any kind of dihedral in the bird uh, and longer wings, you know, with the Swainson's, it's like almost like a combination of a bootio and a, a harrier put together. Um, you know, those long, thinner wings with any kind of uh, dihedral is never going to look like a red shoulder. So that's one of the big things to look for. They also, uh, Swainson's tend to glide with a, a modified dihedral similar to a Harrier, so they can be tough. Um, but again, the red shoulder does not do that. You'll never see a red shoulder with any kind of dihedral. Um, the wing beat of the Swainson's tends to be, I would say, more stiff um, and, and not as snappy or not as occipiter like as the red shoulder. Uh, so just a few tips about, about those guys. Uh, while we're waiting for a couple more to come in, um, I'd like to play turkey vulture and black vultures. We did talk about the differences between those guys a little bit too. Size, demeanor, and wing flap are the basic things needed to tell these two vultures apart. When soaring, the black vulture on the left has shorter wings and almost no tail compared to the turkey vulture on the right. Also notice the black vulture's wings are pushed forward when soaring, unlike the rectangular winged turkey vulture. When soaring, the black vulture will be more stable and not teeter or wobble as much as the turkey vulture. Both birds have upturned dihedrals, but the black vulture will be more shallow. Check out the wing flap of the black vulture. It's fast and choppy. They give the impression of a little kid trying to catch up with their older siblings. The turkey vulture almost never flaps and instead rocks and wobbles in the wind excessively. Even though they are both vultures, they appear very different in flight. Okay, someone had asked to see the species slide for peregrine, I believe. I would, I'm going to bring that up. And I would ask whoever was requesting that, oh, they can't unmute. For security reasons, we don't allow unmuting. Maybe add in your chat if there's something specific about the peregrine that you're looking for, we can talk through that. Um, that was, uh, I'll just jump in, that was Marilyn Parker, if you're still on Marilyn. Okay. Um, I'm seeing a little bit here, I'm trying to double duty uh, in terms of the Merlin. Um, I wish I would have shown it. I have a clip of uh, the Merlin actually eating that songbird <laughs> from the beginning of the, the program. And they tend to pick it apart in flight. And so you can see feathers um, kind of going everywhere and it's going to eat it, uh, it, pick it apart, eat all the good parts as much as it can until it's at a point where it either is going to get rid of the, the bones and wing structure um, and then eat whatever's left um, or it might just let it go. 
Raptors will eat everything um, in some cases, you know, not, not all the bigger bones, um, but the fur and everything, much like the uh, owls do, they'll cough up um, less shapen, but uh, less shapely, but still small pellets with some of those um, entrails and stuff. Kind of nasty. Sorry to go there, but uh, nature is that way. Um, so I hope that helped. Um, okay. Someone, I think Marilyn was good with seeing the picture of the peregrine. So I'm going to get us back to our side by sides and I believe... go ahead. Sorry, Josh. Go ahead. Uh, Cooper's versus Goss was another one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we'll show that right here. Even though goshawks are larger than Cooper's hawks, size is often hard to judge with lone birds. Check out the goshawk on the left. The bird has a thicker, square-looking tail and slightly stockier-looking wings, giving hints of striving to be a budio. The Cooper's hawk on the right is long-tailed with thinner-looking wings compared to the goshawk. When soaring, these birds hold their wings in a slightly different manner. The goshawk holds its wings flat where the coop is showing a slight upturn or dihedral. Just as sharpies make tighter circles than coops when soaring, coops make tighter circles than goshawks. Notice how in control the goshawk is on the left. Its wing beat is also very smooth and powerful. In contrast, the cooper's hawk is flapping more and seems less stable as it rises and drops in the air. Look at the goshawk's large head and extreme bulging on the trailing edges of its wings. The coop is stocky, but nowhere near as muscular. Okay, so just a real quick shout out again. Feel free to visit Hawks on the Wing for guides, and including the movies with the side-by-sides. Uh, and lastly, you know, just a shout out to Hamana. Big thank you for supporting this program. Um, I know we're getting a little tight on time, so I do want to turn it over to Jane, the executive director, um, ahead of ending, but uh, stay tuned for April. Uh, we will be sharing, um, sharing that program shortly. So Jane, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Josh. And thanks for a great, a great program. We were full up um, with some overflow to Facebook, so that was great. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining and, and uh, staying tuned to these monthly programs. Um, as Josh mentioned, we will be um, filling in the April through, I believe, September, October uh, timeframe very shortly on our website. Um, again, I saw a couple of you put your emails in. So great. Thank you, because we send out um, some pretty regular notifications for these programs and, and other things that we're up to. So um, we'll leave this going for a couple of minutes and you're welcome to, um, to still give your email if you haven't haven't already done so. So with that, we thank you so much. Oh, we will also be able to uh, answer some follow-up questions if we didn't get to you um, in time on the show. So if you want to hear back from us, make sure you give us your email. Thanks again, folks, and we'll see you hopefully next month.